The sexual abuse crisis has made me feel much more alone in my faith. Um, I can't trust that the institution that I actually have been very proud of in many ways, that it will buttress me because it seems to be struggling so much itself. And that's been a big shock to think I've got to turn to f other friends um, and, uh, to, to keep me going. So it, it's a sort of a loss of pride in the institution. That, that I don't know whether that rings true to you, Adam, at all. Um, I guess as a convert, and especially as a, as a young convert coming in while we're in the midst of all of it, um, I mean, my first interaction with the entire crisis was to hear my very first parish priest read out a pastoral letter from one of the bishops, you know. And so that was that was my first interaction. I, I didn't know any victims. I had no Catholic family who were, um, uh, you know, who had struggled with it. I didn't know a single other person. I didn't have any lay people around me, you know, aside from my sponsor, who was also a convert. Um, so... I've always approached it from a distance, you know, and um, the effect that it's had on me is to keep me at a distance from the church. So, because partly because of the child sexual abuse scandal, and through reporting I did on the Royal Commission, I ended up failing to complete my RCIA um, and ended up in the Anglican Church for a few years, and I've only just come back in the last kind of twelve months to the Catholic Church to finally be received. So, really? So that was the so it was that same thing, you know. I think it it tends to push you away and to divide people away from the institution. Has it caused you to reflect differently um, on the hierarchy and the leadership in the church? I think that I, I've, it's been a slow process for me of watching different strands. It's been quite a trajectory for me over many, many years because I've been reporting it as well. But I, it's not that I loathe the hierarchy or I've lost complete respect. I just can see that they are completely preoccupied with it and are not going to be available to do the job that I thought was their job. And that's been a really big shock. I've realised how much I was invested in saying, will the officials please run the church, just like I want the officials to run the ABC? I want the officials to run the ANZ Bank, you know? I want the officials to run the church. Well, they're not, go they're not going to for a while. Like, they're, they're going to be so busy, preoccupied, whatever you wish to say. So what do we do about that? Do we abandon the institution? Do, do, do we think differently about what is required? That's where I am, wrestling with that. Right, and, and Adam, for you, with regard to church leadership? Yeah, um, I think one of the things that came out of the commission sessions to me, um, <clears throat> and especially with George Pell, with Cardinal George Pell, who's obviously a kind of key figure of all the Catholic sessions of the Royal Commission, was that in instances where... Uh, like for instance, the John Ellis case, where the people remained Catholics, the church would would um, abdicate their pastoral responsibilities and basically hand over, like George says in one session, Cardinal Pell says in one session, we don't want there to be grievous infusion, you know, for us to still be involved with the person as they're suing us in a pastoral sense. And so the church, to me, it's like the church um, steps away from its pastoral responsibilities, its Catholic responsibilities, and instead relies too much on the secular institution of the law. Which know? is so ironic. Which I is mean, really, yeah. So the secular has massively found them out, mm. found the church out, and, you know, sort of crept up in a way that is, is still, the yeah. ramifications are just still staggering. There's this incredible session um, where, where um, one of the commissioners and, and Cardinal Pell are uh, having this, this, this exchange um, and they're reminding him of his duties as a churchman. Oh, and he's yeah, saying, oh, but we're entitled to defend ourselves under the law. And this is a total role reversal, mm. you know. But at the same time, and I think, uh, as, I think as grievous as that is, it hasn't diminished my faith in the clergy, you know, because I've got no other option. You know what I mean? My entire, my interface with the church has always been, not through family, it's always been through priests. And so I'm lucky in that sense, I think, to have seen all the good work that that priests do and how much a lot of them care about it you know I'm so close to them all the time because they're my mentors as a convert um, and so I don't think I've lost faith in the church's institution or necessarily in the hierarchy but in those key figures I think who are at the center of the whole scandal um, I think see I'm glad to hear you say that because this is what has been really animating me and it's been giving me a, a really really thinking a lot about it is that 
I do not believe that sexual abuse crisis is a full or even a partial representation of the church yeah. that I have observed. However, it is a very true representation of part of it. Yeah. What do we do with that? I find it very, very difficult to think through. And I, and I, I don't know whether this is a useful analogy, but I wonder, I thought at one point, this must have been what Germans felt like at the end of World War II, if it doesn't sound too silly, that they knew that the thing that they was part of their identity had performed some appalling things, but they knew it wasn't the full story of their country and their identity and their heritage. So what did they do with that apparently contradictory position? You've got to dwell in both countries. It's very tough. Yeah. I mean, the question for me is, you know, is the Catholic Church at its most authentic when it's covering up child abuse. You know, the yeah. answer's just obviously no. It's obviously no. And Very that, well put. And it's the same with members of the clergy, you know, who are called upon to be like Christ, you mm -hmm. know, and give themselves up. And I think all of those negatives, um, all, uh, you know, all those negative outcomes that you get through this arm's length attempt to manage the child abuse scandal, you know, you see it again and again mm -hmm. where that you can watch the members of the hierarchy try and deal with the legal ramifications of it and the insurance companies and you know the, the various demands that the secular world places on them and at the same time grappling it's so comp it must be very complicated for them but they failed so comprehensively i think because they lacked humility as you said you know it's a, well i just don't a, think a, they were good shepherds yeah you know, the good shepherd the parable of the good shepherd is the the metaphor of the good shepherd is the greatest you know research has shown it's the one that people come back to again and again it's mm. so consoling yeah. the good shepherd and they weren't in some key cases. But I knew a lot of good shepherds. Mm -hmm. I still do. So as I said, you've got to hold both intention. It asks a lot of one. Um, and I suppose, I don't think we can dodge that. I just don't think there's a lovely, clear, cohesive answer. Jolton, you, you mentioned there about holding the two things in tension, okay, a crisis and maybe things aren't being dealt with so well at the moment, but we're dealing with an institution that is 2,000 years old with a huge, um, mm. strong tradition and that over those centuries um, has done a lot of good. But, but can you talk a bit more about um, how do you hold those two things together in, in a moment of crisis, but also just a... a huge strong tradition there I have in terms of just how you manage this which has done my head in at times <laughs> especially since this Royal Commission has been on I would say but not just that I think I went through a nadir when I saw that US documentary on abuse of deaf children that was around about three or four years ago I found it utterly, utterly devastating and I think I really went to some rather dark place and I couldn't bear staying there so I emerged and I thought, well I'm just going to have to emerge, I don't quite know what I emerged to. But I think the business of holding them in tension is to say somehow or other the lovely effortless consolation that I have got from my faith over many years, as well as questioning, but really there's been a lot more consolation than I think generally gets recognised. I won't have that. So, um, and again, I think that's what Germans must have felt like. For, they must have thought, are we ever going to be proud of Germany ever, ever again? <laughs> what a de devastating moment. But still, you've got to contribute to the rebuild. And so I sort of thought... Well, it's not going to be a nice feeling, but I'm there because I am a Catholic. It's just too hardwired. So I've got to stand there and it, it'll be edgy. It, there'll be nothing glorious about it, uh, I, I, but I'm just there. I've got to be there. And in a, more or less, that's where I've tried to go. So I feel robbed of all the lovely exuberance and laughter and fun that I had in the Irish Catholic tribe. For all of the problems, I had that. I don't have that effortlessly. And I just, I suppose I survive on the longer heritage. So, so Adam, so you're coming into the church in this moment of crisis, 
but there must be something about its what the church is and its tradition that's drawn you in. Yeah. But can you talk a bit? Can you talk about what is drawing you despite the crisis? Yeah. Um, I think it as as I've gone through the process of becoming a Catholic, increasingly, the attraction has gone from being drawn to the church towards I think in a in a in a purer sense being drawn to God and seeing the church in its proper place as a mediator rather than as an end in itself. And I think that the commission's work um, and talking with priests has helped me to put that in perspective. And so you can say, okay, look, the church is a is a weak and broken kind of thing. So, you know, stuffed and its holiness varies from age to age, but the instruments that God uses for our salvation are human beings. You know, there are other human beings. Um, including Christ himself, is you know, fully human and fully divine. And unfortunately, the priests don't get the divinity part. You know, they just get the fully human part and holy orders. <laughs> so I think, I think for me, um, to, you know, like the question that you, the way you ask it to Geraldine, you know, how do you keep these two things in tension? And immediately for you, you say, it's a matter for yourself personally. How do I do it? And to me, I look at the church and go, how does the church keep those two things in tension? How does the church keep... Yeah. You know, like how does how does the church say we're going to um, discharge our responsibilities to um, the congregations in our care and at the same time make try and try and repent for child abuse? And you know, I, I really do wonder sometimes whether or not the bishops, especially people at the top end of the chain, really get it. You know, and you look back to say, you know, what what do you get from the church's history? You look back at you know bishops, popes doing penance publicly, mm, being mm. involved with their congregations, saying to people, we failed, you know, not just apologies in, in, in pastoral letters, but, you know, you've got popes who go out and do snow penance and this kind mm, of stuff, mm. you know, and really make it clear, fasting and days of rogation and all of those traditional things that the church um, has kind of set aside as being antiquated. And I, I really wonder, I'm like, I wonder whether or not, you know, what, what, the, what the church would look like if Pell, George Pell had, you know, kind of well, marched uh, through the streets in sackcloth <laughs> and ashes or something like that. You know, I mean, it's, I mean, it's silly in a certain sense. But no, no. You wonder. I mean, what I, funny enough, what I wanted um, uh, Benedict to do, because it was when, I mean, yeah. I wanted him to actually say, rather than a year of grace and a year of mercy, I wanted him to say, we will say nothing for a year. We will merely listen. Yeah, yeah. We will redeem ourselves. We will earn back the trust. But I want every bishop around the world to go to his people and to ask questions of them. Now, I thought that would have been yeah. uh, both... Well, it would have been functionally very clever mm. because they would have found out a lot, but it would have been um, a, a sort of an overt sign, hey... We've got to really humbly, in effect, ask forgiveness. Now, I thought that would have been a wonderful thing to have done, mm. and they didn't do anything like that. I thought it was a real lost opportunity. Mm.